Welcome, my friends, to another episode of the Made in China podcast. This is Rico speaking from Source Find Asia. This week, we went back to the basics. China Mike and I had a Skype session. We did a Q&A episode. I did a Q&A episode in episode five. Uh, but since then, we've collected a ton of questions. Uh, people always shooting questions to us. If you want to reach out, that's info at sourcefindasia.com. Uh, we covered questions along the lines of, you know, warranties with factories when you're producing electronic products. How do you manage that? Um, we talked about spot checks if a factory is, uh, you know, swapping out materials or they're clearly producing inferior product. How do you handle those things? We had somebody ask us about, you know, just getting into sourcing. How do you handle the pricing? When do you get paid? Uh, Amazon FBA questions uh, we ca- we covered as well. You know, basic manufacturing terms, you know, OEM, ODM, MOQ, and we went into shipping terms as well. Guys, thank you for listening to the podcast. We've we've gotten a lot of reviews recently. Uh, again, we need the iTunes reviews. It's going to keep us growing, keep us going. Let's us know as well that uh, we're providing good content. Without further ado, here's the episode. I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. <laughs> First of all, Absolutely. can you just explain yeah. to people where you are right now? <laughs> I I am in a parking lot on the outskirts of Chicago in a Target slash Starbucks parking lot because this is the most quiet place at the moment I have to record the podcast and it's actually kind of cozy and comfortable and I'm drinking my coffee and Doing uh, doing a uh, Made in China podcast. I'm pretty excited about it, Rico. <laughs> Look at this guy, glo- global entrepreneur. <laughs> Running podcasts out of his car. Uh, I mean, I feel great. Like we had, we had a productive day and then played football or soccer in, you know, what was it a couple hours ago? No, yeah. Doing a podcast. I would like to say for people who don't know anything about China and don't live in China, what is it like to play football? Or in my case, you know, I play basketball all the time in China. Um, What is that like getting like a pickup game of of football in in China? Oh, that's, 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 I mean, it's, it's okay. If you're a foreigner, it's kind of fairly easy because I find that every time I go, to one of these places like they always want me to join the teams you know okay i don't know if they yeah. see it. they think i'm like i'm a ringer or something i'm just gonna go in and like <laughs> kill it but like i don't want to I, I actually i don't like that you know i don't like that so I, i'm like i know i always i almost always decline like i'd rather come there with some friends and, and play yeah well i think what i was kind of trying to get at it was like how does the process work i totally disagree with you i love that because <laughs> pick up football pick up basketball i was saying you know, you were saying that chinese people are like hey foreigner i want you to play i actually like that because you know most of the time when you go to the gym or, or the courts outdoor courts in china for basketball there's a million people there and you're not going to get a game quickly if nobody knows you and and you're trying to just jump on yourself, you know, yeah, if you bring your own team, you can, you can figure out a way to, to, to jump in. But it's nice when somebody's like, Hey man, let's go now. It's like, I don't have to be here two and a half hours. I can be here for an hour and a half and get all the games yeah, that it, I need in. Yeah. It's it, like, you have to, you have to reserve the pitches before you go. Like we, we, yeah. we called the place um, earlier today and reserved the place for two hours. And then we had to pay about, uh, sixty dollars. Right. Like. Yeah. That that's the thing that I was gonna I was gonna touch on. I mean, in Guangzhou, uh, I've been to Beijing and Shanghai as well. They have outdoor courts where guys will play three on three half court, maybe four on four half court. And in Guangzhou, it's crazy. There's this place called the Sports Center, and there's thirty courts, thirty full courts. Maybe maybe between twenty and thirty full courts for sure. So that's what you know, 40 to 60 half courts and every single one of them's full. Every single one of them's running three on three, four on four games. 
And that you can get in for, for, you know, like a dollar and a half US, which is cool. But if you want to play a real game and you want to play against good players, yeah, you have to rent a court. And sometimes, you know, you just at 60 bucks for a pitch, I feel like that's a really good good price. If you're trying to go in the center of the city, it's going to be double that. Same with, with basketball. And it, that can get annoying, you know. When, when, when I come back to ch- uh, Chicago, I come back to L.A., it's great, you know, spending $35 a month for a 24-hour gym that has two beautiful wood courts and I'm running full-court games. And it's just just very, very different. Yeah, I think with soccer, it's a little bit different because you need, like, you need, like, goal posts. You need, like, a dedicated sure. pitch. Like, sure, it depends. Sure, sure. You know, you can have the... Well, industry. I mean, that depends on where you are, man. When I was in Europe, people were playing on the basketball courts or in the parking lot. But, but, but that's my point, is, like, you can have the indoor court. Like, if it, you can use a basketball court as, as a soccer pitch. But then if you want to play, like, on grass outside, it's there's, like, a, that needs to be, like, a dedicated space. And then I think that's... It's limited, you know? Especially in... Well, a, yeah. In a, in a you, you, you and the other foreigners you mingle with only, only, only settle for the best, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you know how I am. Uh, I'm just I'm just a high class guy. Man. What can I do? I wear bow ties. You, know? you do wear bow ties. I've I wear seen bow ties. It. Like, you know, if I sleep in suits, it is <laughs> fresh press suit right when yes. you wake up. Don't don't knock the hustle, man. Like That's Jay-Z, hilarious. So. That's hilarious. Well, guys, we've seen you know, the past few episodes. We've had some pretty cool guests on. You know, we've been getting into their different uh, line of expertise but you know it's been a while since we had our shine we had our time to talk about what's going on with us talk about what's going on with the business and the podcast and and you know get some some insight from some of the listeners as to what they'd like to hear and some of the questions that they have yeah so you know we just wanted to do a q and a of, of of course over the course of the podcast i mean it's only been like a month but mm-hmm. we, we, you were always getting new questions um, from all friendship circle, from new people that discover the podcast. It's been so, a good month. We've got a good response. It's been it's been a ton of fun. Yeah, I think we're at like three hundred and fifty subscribers. So, Whoa, uh, that's it's kind of insane. Like we went from like ten people subscribing to the blog to three hundred and fifty. You know, in, in the space of. To, in the space of like three to four weeks. Spectacular. I, Tell your friends, send us questions. Send us questions. We need those iTunes reviews, people. Yes. Thank you to those who did <laughs> review us, by the way. Appreciate it's you. It's the only reason why I wake up in the morning. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no reviews. Back to bed. Get back to bed. All right. So am I taking the first question? Are you going to take the first Yeah, question? sure, sure, sure. Read away. You're abusing me, you know. <laughs> So the first question is from Ray. His, uh, he, had a, he had two questions, actually. So the first question he asked is, is it possible to get a Chinese factory to provide you with a warranty on electronic products? If so, how would you approach them with that? Uh, yeah, I think it is possible to get a warranty on electronic products. Um, I don't know what a standard warranty is. I think it's um, generally one year, you know. One year. Yeah, I think a lot of factories would, would do that. Uh, it depends on the product. It depends, of course, on how many you're buying. Are you just buying stock? Or are you manufacturing 10,000 units? I'm sure that's going to have a big effect on, on what kind of, kind of warranty you're going to get. Um, you know, I think f- fulfilling or following through with that warranty is not always easy. Uh, for example, um, those of you who don't know, I was a part of a startup company that launched on Kickstarter uh, called Otis and Eleanor. We sold a, a, a speaker, a bamboo speaker called the Bongo. And uh, getting a warranty on, on those speakers was was good on, on face value, but we were sending those all over the country or excuse me, all over the world, you know, individual speakers. So if some guy in Denmark says, um, you know, Hey, my speaker did, doesn't work anymore after three months or I'm having a scratch, you know, that things happen, of course, with electronic products. I don't necessarily know that that factor is going to immediately replace that unit based off something that somebody on the other side of the world says happened, you know, and at that point also, 
how are you going to conveniently return that for them? Are they going to send those parts back to you? Where are they going to send it to? Are they going to send it to your U.S. office? Are they going to send it to your Hong Kong Fulfillment Center? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So, you know, maybe they'll give you a, a, a fixed percentage of, of goods saying, hey, we'll give you a 2% overrun of, of the products. Or if there's a major issue along the way i'm sure they would provide some type of warranty but i think that the ultimately my answer is uh this just shows how important qc is in the production process yeah so when you you're talking about qc you're just saying be very very stringent make sure that they're producing it to the best of its uh, to the best quality possible and then also checking for any potential issues Absolutely. Know what it is you want. Know how you want that electronic product to perform. And you have to check it along the way as it's being assembled, as it's being manufactured. Um, it needs to go through a pretty rigorous test when before you ship it out to make sure that those products are, are what, you know, as advertised. When you did um, the Otis and Eleanor, did you did you use a QC company separately to do to do the QC or did you guys do it yourselves? Uh, we did it ourselves at the time, you know, in, in, with the, the gift of the pine side, we probably would have used a QC company or a combination of a Q, QC company and us. But, um, yeah, we did a lot of assembly in house, but there was a ton of spot checks. You know, I think we did a really good job of making sure that, um, a lot of the speakers that had an issue didn't get boxed up and shipped out. And I think that's that's at the end of the day the most important thing. And you know you're going to have to realize if you're if you're making a commitment to electronic products from anywhere, let alone China, that you're going to have some defective units, and that's just a cost, you know part of the cost of business. You should probably take that into consideration prior to you know even even making the order. Yeah. So like when you're making an order, you don't want to just order the exact amount that you need to sell, you maybe want to sure. give yourself some leeway for defective products. Of course, defective products. I mean, you're going to need more than just, just the order amount for other reasons as well, but absolutely, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to have defective products on any order. That's just, that's just a fact. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, it, it depends on your relationship with the factory. I think if, if it's going yeah. to be a, a one-time thing, that's going to be very difficult, but if you develop a relationship with that factory then they're obviously going to be more likely to replace defective products for you because they know that you're going to place another order in three months couldn't or six months. agree more couldn't agree more yeah i've had a ton of ton of situations where you know we we're on good terms with the factory there was an issue it was probably their fault and you know they took measures to to correct that because they knew that we we're going to be plugging more business and that also you know, goes they, to just a, i guess a caveat i was talking to um, this guy who's is starting to get into sourcing, and uh -huh. he said that he found a one of the largest manufacturers in in ch southern China for his particular product that he's sourcing, and he said that you know the company that he's he's sourcing for, um, he basically has been able to drop their per unit cost by thirty percent, and he was saying, oh, should I now start negotiating with this factory more, or should I find another factory? And my advice, a cheaper factory, and my advice to him was, you know, you already dropped the per unit cost by 30%. You found one of the biggest factories in southern China. You know, I would appreciate building a relationship with that factory because it's just going to take a lot of the headache of dealing with a, you know, a factory that's not as reliable. It's not going to re reply to you as much. You want to deal with a professional factory, you already dropped the per unit cost. Just appreciate that. As is, yeah. You know. Yeah, I agree with that. And cost has always been a, a interesting thing for me in the sourcing business. When I first started, that was a constant issue: is negotiating price, and the people that I was dealing with wanted the lowest price, and I was always stressed out about not getting a good enough price. And now, I don't. I don't feel that way. Um, price is obviously important. You can't be paying more than you're selling it for. I understand this, but there's so many other things that go into the cost of, of production. And I think paying a slightly higher price while having that great relationship with the factory could, could prove in the end to be, you know, even cheaper than 
uh, a factory that gives you the lowest cost from from the get go. You know, I think and, and something a lot of people who who do this business in China say that a factory, a Chinese factory, a lot of the time is going to say yes. They're going to say, okay, yeah, no problem. We can reduce that cost. We can get it cheaper, but they're not going to make the product as well as they would if 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 they had the price point that they need to to make that product. You know what I mean? So the next question from Ray was, what is the main criteria you use to narrow down potential manufacturers? The main tools, I mean, we've talked about that a ton of times, right? You know, using using Alibaba, using AliExpress, made in China, these these type things to, think, to, to locate the factories. Yeah, I think we've talked about that before, for mm -hmm. sure. I, I think when he says criteria, I think he means mainly like, what are the things that we're looking out for uh, when we're narrowing oh, okay. the potential? That factor. makes more sense. Yep. I would say um, don't discount instinct when you're talking to these factories, um, you know, how, how, how they receive you, how they talk to you. You know, I think for me, I've done this enough times and I've sourced enough products that prior to talking to the factory, I have some idea what I'm talking about. It's not, it's not my first time talking to a factory. You know, I know what to look out for. And if I have a good instinct uh, about them and I, and I feel good about the process, I think that's really important. Um, we've talked about this before. I'm sure on the podcast is a factory that has different departments, I think is, is a, is a big key. So, you know, if you go and visit them or you're on the phone with them, if, if, if they have people who are, full-time sales and that's their job to worry about uh locating customers for the factory and then they have a qc team you know when they have different departments i think that lends a lot to to the professional level and the credibility of the factory i think that's a really important step and uh you know communication just how how quickly they get back to you the type of info that they provide, you know, I think that's those are all real important things when when narrowing down what factory you're going to use. Yeah, I think specifically we we talked more in depth about that in episode six. I think it was five mm -hmm. things to know when manufacturing your own product. Right, 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 right. So if you want to know more about that, you can check out that episode. Um, Sweet. Next question. Do you want to handle that? Is, yeah, sure. It's from Mr. John John Mullen. If you spot check a supplier during production. And you realize that they have cut a cut a corner, or overlooked something, or have just done something wrong, whether being sneaky or ge a genuine misunderstanding. How should you communicate that this is not acceptable in a way which will not damage your relationship with the supplier? Uh, that was a run-on sentence, John. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should have edited this question. But I, I think, first off, like um, if it's a misunderstanding, you want to communicate that. You want to show them, yes, you, you've, you've seen this mistake and you want to communicate that's not acceptable. And then just take note of that. Let them know that you will be checking for that issue going forward so they know that you know they can't just do that again. And then for sure, you if you have a QC team, let them know about that problem. Of course, you know, you want to be checking up with the factory and asking them, have they fixed it? How are they going to fix it? You know, th these kind of things. And you just see how they respond to it. If they can explain to you how they're going to fix that issue and if they're apologetic about it, then I think you should be fine. Just make sure you check for it in the future. Yeah, I kind of feel like it's it's the same as with any kind of relationship, right? Whether it's your, your kid or your friend or your family, you know, what do you do if someone makes a mistake? You just don't, you just don't make them feel like shit about it. You know, there's something that people in China talk about all the time. It's, it's mianza, it's face, you know, people don't like to use face. So if someone screws up uh, during the production process, they shouldn't be worried about how to, how to communicate that to them. You just need to communicate that to them so that you guys can fix it. I think, I think that's, you know, the most important thing during, during, to, the most important communication with with the factory is just to let them know that hey i'm not i'm not doing this to you know get emotional about it or say you did something wrong i'm doing it because i want to to get this order done as quickly as possible and i want to get it done right and and if they understand that they should they shouldn't have 
if she had any, any hard feelings about it, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's basically like HR management. Like, just tell them, right. what they, tell them what they've done well and then tell them what they've done wrong. And what did they say? A compliment sandwich? It was like, tell them what they've done well, tell them what they've done wrong, and then tell them what they've done well again. Yeah, just put it in the middle there. <laughs> I had a professor at University of Florida that, uh, teaching business writing, and that's what she always said. You know, you, you put the negative thing the thing that you want to bring somebody down or you know the even if you're firing an employee it was in the middle of the email you know between yeah. all the nice compliments so yeah, that exactly. could be a good strategy i i think that's the way to just be respectful i think you know you shouldn't, you shouldn't be coming from a perspective of oh they did it on purpose you know mm-hmm. until 100 percent that you know they yeah did until you know that yeah. for sure you know, just, just sure. it's there's always going to be miscommunication, misunderstanding. In fact, that's way more common over here. So, you know, just, right. just tell them what they've done wrong, give them a compliment, and then move forward with it. What about Agreed. the other part? Was what about if you know they're being sneaky? How do you handle that? I would have to know the situation. Have depends to be on on, on how. Yeah, it depends on how they're being sneaky. Are they trying to swap out materials? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, are they trying to bunch, uh, bump up the price when it's unnecessary? Just as a thought, they, a thought experiment, let's say, you know, they're trying to swap up materials. They're using a cheaper grade of, of the material that you want. And you've told them before, and then they, they do it again. Ah. Uh, to me, that's just a terrible sign, especially if this is your first order. If they know that they're swapping out the materials, number one, two, they don't tell you. And then, you know, even to to a deeper extent, like you just said, they understand that, you know, they're swapping out the materials. In my opinion, you got to get out of there. That's not somebody you want to be working with. You know, that's not something that you want to try to to, to, to mend unless you, you think it's just one person at the factory making a decision. I don't know. Even at that point for me, that that's a, that's a huge red flag. I agree. You know, if they do that once, they're going to do that constantly over all aspects of, of, you know, the supply chain. So I say that's a, that's a red flag. Now, if you've already put down a deposit, you know, it's, I, it depends on the situation for how exactly you're going to proceed forward. But yeah, for me, I I can't accept that. All right. Next one is from Carl. He said, I'm just getting started in the sourcing game. I'm about to land my first client. How do you structure your pricing in a proposal? Should I be taking a percentage of the purchase order? Do I take 30% of my fee when my client pays the factory the initial 30% deposit? Just as a quick caveat before um, we start to answer that question. When he says when the factory... Uh, pays the initial 30% deposit. I think we mentioned this, but Mm -hmm. generally when you're placing an order at the factory, the standard in China is to pay a 30% 30 deposit up front and then 70% deposit once you've uh, okayed the quality of the, of the, of the product. And it's, it's about to ship out. Um, Right. Yep. Yeah. Although, although there were a couple of factories that tried to tell us this year, things are changing in China and they're charging 50% up front, which is, that's, uh, yeah. that's pretty much nonsense. Yeah. It was bullshit, man. Because <laughs> cause then it, it did. So it turned out to be bullshit, yeah, right? hundred percent bullshit because then yeah. that factory was not the best factory. And then we found a factory that was, you know, one of the best factories in, in Southern China and they were 30%, 30% you know, all the way. Yeah. yeah. This is a real tough question, Carl, because when you are a newcomer, um, I think developing your pricing structure is extremely difficult. Um, yeah, how do you justify you know, the prices that you're that you? It's tough. It's tough. You know, when you have more experience, when you have clients under your belt, when you have you know content online that you can draw from to show people what you've done, it's a lot easier to justify prices. You know, when clients are coming to you and you're not reaching out to, to people, you know, to offer your services, it's a different situation. Um, you know, some people, I've battled with this back and forth. Sometimes I've just said, hey, this is the cost. Are you comfortable with it? And I've built my cost into it. Um, I'm kind of to a place now where I'm perfectly comfortable saying this is the cost of the, the product. And these are the additional costs that we'll need to help guide you through the process. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely, if I understand this question correctly, saying, do I take, 
thirty percent of my fee with that deposit? I would say yes, absolutely. Um, having when you're in China and and you, you and said thirty percent when when uh, uh, he's saying when, he yeah. Go ahead. Say, I was going to say, say go why ahead. not? Why not differentiate differentiate himself from the factory? Why not take, let's say, fifty percent? Um, That's for, fine. Yeah. That's fine. My point was just you need money up front. Yep. Okay. You need money up front because you're going to be moving all over the place. You need to be able to adjust quickly if something goes wrong, and 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 if you don't have any money dedicated towards that project, and you have to throw money from, you know, petty cash or another project onto that project, things just become a complete mess mm -hmm. so i would say definitely definitely you need in order to do the best job on that project you need you know some 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 money to move around just in case i i 100 percent agree that um you need to take money up front and uh, of course money on the back end but like money up front is is, is extremely important like mike said you don't want to be then struggling to you know hosting to get other jobs just so that you can finish this job right um right and then the other thing he mentioned was should he be taking a percentage of the purchase order um in my opinion i think it depends on how large the order is it depends mm -hmm. on who you're dealing with like if it's a smaller order it doesn't really make sense to take a percentage of the purchase order right um, right if it's a larger order then yeah it makes sense but then again a lot of clients feel uncomfortable with that you know Sure. Yeah. What we've tried to do is is set some basic charges for basic services, and then you know we can quote a price for for each specific project because different projects have different requirements from a sourcing standpoint. So it's hard to say yes, this is going to be two hundred fifty dollars every single time because for one a project A, it'll take ten hours of work. For project B, it might take. 30 hours of work so it's not always easy to give and you know to have that quote prior to knowing what the project is this is like the thing that me and you always talk about and i i almost i like i'm getting better at it but i i constantly have a little bit of a struggle with how to quote the, and the pricing because i understand from a western perspective you're used to going to a website and saying I pay X amount of money for this, 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 this. Whereas with sourcing, it, like you said, it's it's every project is different. So I cannot, we cannot have a standard pricing on our website for sourcing projects because, you know, if you're going to create a completely new product and you have mm -hmm. to make a mold, you have to, all this, we have to find a new factory. Like, you know, there's going to be issues, there's going to be revisions. Maybe you thought it was going to take three months to make this and it ends up taking six, seven months. We can't have like a standard pricing for that. It needs to be, you need to take into consideration every single person's project and then give them a quotation based on the amount of work and hours we're going to put in. So, you know, what we're trying to do right now is figure out what are certain things in the sourcing game that tend to be standard. And that's like finding factories is always the same process. Of course, it varies a little bit. Some Some products are more difficult to find than others, but generally you know it's not going to vary that much so that's why we have a, a sourcing report service now on, on the website and then more recently we're, we're starting to get immersed into the amazon fba world and we're seeing the the needs that fba sellers have in the sourcing game and we're also starting to figure out like a flat rate for amazon fba sellers right that those are things that we can do but then if you have a specific project and you have a product that you want to make or something like that, we we have to have that consultation stage, talk about that, see what's involved, and then give you a quotation. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'll yeah. say to Carl, man, you're going to grow into it. <laughs> <laughs> Baby steps, Mr. Carl. All right, the next question is coming from our good buddy Nick. Uh, he asks... Since you've been on both sides of the equation, exporting to Asia Pacific and importing from Asia Pacific, what differences do you see? I'm going to let you handle that one. <laughs> oh, that's right back to me. I'm asking my own question. All right. Uh, off the top of my head, I would say, I mean, most of the exporting from china that i've done has been to the united states we have sent things to many different countries but the vast majority would be north america canada and uh usa 
Uh, I think the import rules and laws into the States are a lot more loose than they are to China. Um, it's pretty easy for me to send a five to 20 kg box of goods to the USA without it being flagged. Or if it's flagged, it's hit with a light, um, a light tariff fee. Uh, it doesn't take a ton of work to get goods cleared. Uh, if you don't have a specific license, they might let it slide and, and bill you until you get that license. We have had things that have got hung up in customs and have been a pain in the neck, especially around Christmas time. I would like to um, really highlight that, that if you're trying to move goods for your, your business, your brand or selling on Amazon, you definitely want to be ahead of the game shipping uh, Christmas time because come December 10 plus, it's a pain in the neck. But when you're bringing goods into China, um, China Customs is tough, man. I mean, I send stuff, FedEx, samples. I've had sample pieces of fabric that maybe costed 35 cents that I've had held for a week and a half, and I have to pay $16 in, in China. Uh, I, I seem to always deal with that. And if somebody's listening to this and has effective ways to import goods into china please contact us that would be spectacular because it's something that that i've dealt with a lot over the past you know four to five years um hong kong makes things a little bit easier we're closer to hong kong shipping goods into hong kong isn't a big deal and then there's ways to get goods from hong kong into china um man i just said something i really wanted to say and, and it's it slipped my mind i remember what i was going to say uh I think in China too, it's not, it might not be as, as standard. And I don't know if this is still the case, but this is something Chinese people used to tell me all the time is that being a customs agent in China is a highly coveted position and people who work <laughs> these, no, it is man. No, people, no, this, this is what, this is what so many people in China have told me that this, you can be the valedictorian of one of the best universities in your province and you still won't get selected for these jobs i've heard that it's a very uh who's no who knows who type of position you, sometimes these people have to bribe their way into these positions by paying hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars this is actually what i've heard please uh check my sources here i don't know if this is 100 percent true but it's it's something i've heard you know word of mouth being in china for a long time I don't know and the reason the re yeah, right. And the reason is because these people have control of what's coming in and out of the country. And, you know, a lot of times they'll just say, hey, you just shipped 100 kgs of this product. I need 1500 US dollars, whether whether there's some reference for for that charge or not. So it's not as clear uh, cut. And I, I think that's one really, really big difference is um you have to have your your p's and q's in order if you're going to bring things into china the first thing i thought about when you said it was a coveted position was better have my money you know that was the first thing yeah I for real <laughs> That's what yeah was... those people make money man because yeah. they're taking a they're taking a dime out of every piece of tiny ass fedex fabric that you sent out you know when you're taking 16 bucks off a square of fabric you know you're getting paid all right so Nick's next question is, what are the three cardinal rules you need to know when uh, about importing to and from Asia Pacific? Oh, that's tough. That's a very specific question. There's like three cardinal rules. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, is he just talking about the logistics side of things? I think or? so. I think he, well, logistics, I think he's talking about everything in terms of importing. I guess you covered most of that in, in your last answer, to be honest. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, how the goods are packaged is, is super important. Um, you know, having sturdy boxes, having enough protection inside the, the packaging so that the goods are safe. Uh, making sure that your cargo is well labeled and you know any 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 licenses and certificates needed are are clearly marked and and all your paperwork and doc, uh, all your documents and paperwork is prepared prior to the shipment so that when it lands at either the destination or the port that you know everything is e easily recognizable i'd add in um this is something that can help you really well, a lot is getting a reliable freight forwarder 
and yes. introducing them to your manufacturer relatively yes. early in the process. Yeah, I, I would say, sorry to cut you off, I have dealt heavily with freight forwarders in China. Um, they are great. If you find a good one, they are great. They can cut your costs significantly, and they can also help um, cut some corners mm -hmm. in, in, in China. You know, you might not need as many formal document, documents if you're shipping with a freight forwarder. Um, however, if you have everything in check and you want to go through that process, which takes a little longer and ultimately pay a little bit more money, uh, you can, you can go directly with like a DHL or a UPS and, um, it does have to be more formal and it does at the end of the day require more money, but, uh, it's a pretty awesome service once you've established it. So if you have a a functioning business for, you know, let's say a battery charger for your phone and you've set everything up, you have all the documents, you have all the licenses necessary to one export from China and to import into your country of choice. And you're working with DHL, you know, once you, once you pick up steam and, and keep pushing orders, it's going to be a super effective process. You're not going to have any hangups on shipments. It's going to come to your location super quick. And, and they're just, they're awesome. They provide a really great all-in-one service. So it depends on which um, is more in a more, a more appealing option to you. Yeah. Like um, we, we have a freight forwarder we, we worked with in the past and he's a Chinese guy and he, he's, he's super reliable. Recently we had a situation where he gave us two price points, right? He gave us one with the kind of, you know, not so clear documentation. And then he had one with the clear documentation. And that's what he does. And then he just basically says one is going to cost you $400 less. The other one's going to cost you $400 more. It's up to you to choose which method you want to. And um, in the process, we had a couple issues. Something got delayed and he actually offered to pay for moving our product from one location to another because he made a mistake you know and that's that's kind of unusual in 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 china so you want to get a, a, a reliable freight forwarder introduce them to your manufacturer very early so that they can prepare all the documentation in advance and then you're not going to be in a situation where there's some document missing or the factory didn't sign something or you know some they, there's some miscommunication between the freight forwarder and the manufacturer Right. Yeah, and just from my experience using freight forwarders in China, um, pay on time, pay on time because they will give you credit terms, which is pretty spectacular, you know, because because to get credit terms with a giant company like UPS or FedEx or DHL requires a lot more, and if you're just paying on time consistently for three to six months with your freight forwarder, they'll start giving you credit terms. And that, that that's a huge help when you're, you're running a, a cash flow heavy business. Next, next question was also, which one do you prefer exporting to Asia or importing from Asia and why? I think we pretty much answered that when we said what exporting and importing from Asia, right? Cause it's just easier. Yeah. It's just a, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I also think just, not even from the the technical side of import and export, just, you know, overall the market, which we're catering to, we understand a little better. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't really, even being in China seven years, I don't really completely understand why Chinese people like what they like and how fads come about. But when I see a certain type of product, I'm like, hey, I know this would go over in LA. Like, this is a New York City product, you know, and, and even being in China for as long as I have, I still don't understand their purchasing habits as well as I do, you know, North America. The last question from Nick was also how generally, I mean, also generally, how much do you, the traders mark the items up as opposed to the actual manufacturers? So I guess he means, um, when you are, you know, sourcing a product off, off of Alibaba, most of the time you're dealing with traders. You're actually not dealing with the factories. And that's not a bad thing, but they do have a markup 
uh, from the per unit cost that they get from the factories. So I guess next question is how much are they marking up these items? How much mo more money are they putting on top from the per unit cost? Yeah, I don't know. For me, I haven't dealt with, I rarely deal with trading companies unless it's, unless for some reason it's easier. Usually that's a sign for me to, to find another factory mm -hmm. on Alibaba. I, I rarely deal with, with trading people. But yeah. if you're a newbie for, and you're not in China, maybe that, that's an easier way, especially if they're good and they're really on top of communication. They'll deal with smaller MLQs. They'll run all over town for you. Like those people do exist and maybe, I don't know, 15 to 25 percent, 15 to 30 percent markup. I'm not I'm not really sure. I think the difficulty and I think part of the reason why Nick was asking that question is because he's doing Amazon FBA and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the FBA guys are new and they have no idea the difference of, uh, between a trader and an actual manufacturer, right? Right. So, right. yeah, that's a difficult question to ask because for us, that's normally a no-no if we're dealing with a trader and it's very easy for us to figure out if it's a trader, especially when we ask them if we can visit their factory and then they start making yeah. excuses or when exactly. we go to the factory exactly. and it's very clear that no one actually really knows this person at the factory. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, we've experienced it in just in our time working yeah. together and, yeah. and I've experienced it a hundred times where somebody comes to me, you know, for services or for help manufacturing and they've already done their due diligence. They've maybe set something up with the factory and, you know, they have this contact and, you know, talk to this girl. She's the person that I've been going through. Can you just verify that everything's okay? And from that first conversation or that first visit, you can tell they're super uncomfortable and they just want no part of, of search find Asia or, you know, or of that, that person who's helping you out. And that's usually a good sign that you are not dealing with the factory. Yeah. You're just dealing with an agent. I'm not saying that they can't be helpful. It's possible. I've dealt with some good agents before, but I I try not to. For me, it's just it's just been hilarious because, like, on occasion, I've had people I contacted on Alibaba, and then we're going back and forth, and then I start to get deeper into the, like, let's say over the course of the week, I start to get deeper into the details of the project, and you know, things initially looked promising. And then as I start to a ask certain questions and they're taking a long time to respond and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going like, why is this taking a day for you to get this answer, you know? And then I'll ask them straight up, like, are you a manufacturer or are you a trader? Oh, actually, I'm a trader. Of course. You know, it just it makes a lot of sense. And then like we were just talking about going to factories and it very, being very clear that they're, this is not where they work on a normal basis. You yeah, know, people don't really know them. Like, <laughs> you know, it's just, hey, hey, buddy, what's this guy's name? Oh, <laughs> like you know, it's, you're taking us on a factory tour, but there's somebody else there taking you on a tour of the factory. Really, like, you know, it's just it's it's hilarious sometimes. Um, yeah. You gonna jump into the next one? Sure. This question's coming from our good friend Spivey. Um, she asks, what do you think the usefulness or uselessness of Alibaba and Alibaba Express are? Okay, so basically Alibaba, everyone knows Alibaba. That's when you're trying to find a actual manufacturer. You're trying to find somebody to make your product or at least place like a large order for a product that exists and maybe you want to customize it more. For Alibaba Express, you can literally just go there and order one product. Like it's, it's, you're, it's basically like an eBay or a Taobao. But of course, you can also order thousands of units on, a, on Alibaba Express. So the usefulness, of course, is if you're on Alibaba Express, you can order one unit to get a sample, to check it out. Um, you don't have to place a, an extremely large order. You can pay with your credit card in Ali, Alibaba Express. The, uselessness aspect would be you're not really sure what you're dealing with because a lot of times I, you know the factories that are on Alibaba depending on which factory you use they might be giving you leftover product that might be a little bit defective um, you know they might be giving you product for a, a customer that 
placed an order and didn't pay for it and maybe this is not something that you could sell you know there's this as a kind of a ton of issues involved with that and you want to do your due diligence but if you do find a reliable good manufacturer on alibaba express you know you can order samples that way and you can get them really quickly and you don't have to deal with the whole process of going back and forth with a with the factory so that's those are the main differences between alibaba and alibaba express sure yeah i think i don't think any of it's useless to be be honest i think it's all learning experience and you know if you have some down experiences or some experiences that you would have rather not had you now you know for next time so that's my opinion about that you know you need to go through the lumps to learn how to do it correctly all right, I think Spivey's next question, and this is kind of important. She was asking about the, she was asking us to explain the basic sourcing terms and shipping acronyms. So the, the mm-hmm. shipping acronyms are also known as INCO terms. Okay. Um, so I guess can we, can we lay these out like on, on, on the site or along with the podcast? I think that would be super helpful because if we're saying all these acronyms and you know, 17 of them, people, it's going to be hard for people to follow. 100%. We're going to do that. I always cool. have I always have the show notes for you guys. Um, so I guess we'll start with the sourcing terms. Mm-hmm. The first one would be OEM. Uh, OEM is Original Equipment Manufacturer. That's basically if you have a product that you 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 see like a product that already exists and you want to order that and maybe put your own branding on it or tweak it a little bit. That's the basic aspect of OEM and then on the flip side there's ODM original design manufacturer that's if you have a product that you're designing it's original design it's so sort of self-explanatory if you have a product that you're designing from scratch right so yeah. that's going to involve you producing a mold you're going to have to provide them with you know 3D renderings and it's going to be much more involved so the benefit of OEM is that it's much faster it's much easier you could literally buy a sample of a product and send it to a factory and say, I want you guys to make this, right? Uh, whereas with ODM, you're going to have to go back and forth with the factory and make sure that your design is, is fully understood, make sure that everything is, is on point. Yeah. She, the next term is uh, MOQ, minimum order quantity. Factories have to make X number of goods in order to, you know, achieve economies of scale and make sure that the uh, the order is oh, worth pumping out. Oh, out the, you know, the economies of scale. Oh, <laughs> there you go. There oh, you go. Shit, I went to son. class, baby. <laughs> um, you know, it, it takes not much longer to make a thousand pieces than it would to take to 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 run off fifty pieces for a lot of different products. So. Factories have MOQs. Um, anybody who sources from China knows that. Uh, QC, quality control, checking the, the goods and the production process as it's happening. Uh, lead time. Lead time just basically means how long is your order going to take from start to finish. Uh, next thing would be the molds. Um, if you... You want to take mold? You've been dealing quite a lot with molds in these past couple months. Yeah, molds are... So if you're making a new product, you know, in order for them to mass produce this product, they need to make a, a basically a, a cast of it. And if you could imagine, let's say, for example, you're making a plastic product. It could be a water bottle. It could be a toy. Um, it could be the, the, the shape of an iPhone case. So that mold would be a steel. Imagine it as two steel slabs and it would basically in the middle, it would have the shape of your product. Um, like a, a a outline of the shape of your product, and then they basically inject hot plastic into that, and it forms that product. So it's a it's a that's that's a basic mold. Um, there's different types of molds, of course. There's, you know, there's injection molds, there's, there's other various different types of molds, and then a paint mold is the next step. You know, after you after you produce the product, they have to paint it. There's for certain products, there's going to be many different parts of it that have different colors. So this paint mold would, again, it's like a stencil. They would uh, take your, you know, iPhone case that has a leopard skin pattern and there'll be one stripe in the stencil. And then they either spray paint that or paint that stripe 
with that stencil that that's a paint mold and then the print mold would be more involved with products where you're packaging uh, where you're you're printing something on uh, fabric or even packaging and that's going to be the general outline of your design so with the print mold you you know depending on how many colors you have you're gonna have to pay for several different paint molds um a uh, print mold sorry so if you if your if your packaging has five six different colors then you're gonna have to pay for five six different print molds uh, and that's that's the basics of that the next step is inco terms inco terms like i said before are shipping terms Man, for these, I'm just going to have to say we got so many different, you know, FOB, Xworks, yeah. DDP, DAT. Mm-hmm. For this stuff, I would say just just check the site, guys. We're gonna we're gonna leave a nice little tutorial up for you, so you can check those out. Um, you know, us talking about them for ten or fifteen minutes might be kind of snooze worthy. All right, guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed the podcast. Like Mike said, we're gonna have you know links to the definition of all the shipping terms and everything we mentioned in this podcast. Um, if you want to find us, that's sourcefindasia.com slash made in China. Um, of course, Facebook, SourceFindAsia, Twitter at SourceFindAsia, Instagram at SourceFindAsia. Reach out to us, info at sourcefindasia.com. We'll continue doing a lot of these Q&A episodes and we need more reviews on iTunes. Keep on saying it. It's going to help us. It's going to help us grow and keep putting out good content for you guys. Yeah absolutely guys again thank you for the initial support it's been a ton of fun and i think you know the more interaction we have with you guys the more possibilities for this uh this podcast moving forward um keep coming at us with the questions if there's anybody in specific that you'd like us to talk to you know we're open to absolutely anything uh we have a great network of people that um we're going to continue to bring in and out of the show so yeah look forward to uh some more great content peace used to have baby lungs choking when i nowadays make the whole seven in a sitting remember back then man we thought we grown up rushing at a kid just to be grown up yeah what's up youtube thanks for watching the video if you like this kind of content i have a special gift for you it's called the definitive sourcing rate arsenal it's our four-step Sourcing it. Link is in the description below. Of course, we also have the Made in China podcast at sourcefindasia.com slash Made in China. Link is in the description below. And of course, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Shake to the water. Drowning.